I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled that you're all here. And uh, I'm also particularly thrilled that, does everybody have that? Yeah. yeah. That you were given a, a little yeah. notebook that yeah. has something called the undiscovered planet. I don't know, wh where is it? Someplace in there, I just saw it open, yes. Do you see that? Do you see that? Uh, you know what we should just do is just uh, let you read it for the next 25 minutes and, uh, and I'll go home. That says, it, that says the story much more excitingly. So uh, that I, I recommend that. That is wonderful reading, I think. <laughs> but I didn't write it. But uh, in any case, it does explain quite nicely both the, the reason why we are so excited about microbial sciences at this university and the sort of things that we are doing uh, to try to bring in investigators that were not uh, working together before and attacking some of the key problems in, in uh, uh, microbial sciences. And notice that I'm not using the word microbiology. We think of it as really it is an integration of many sciences that impact on the microbial activity of the planet. So it's a very interdisciplinary approaches that are being taken. Anyways, that's not what I'm going to be telling you about, although there's great relationships in what that article covers and what I'm going to be talking about. So this lecture tonight, um, first of all, uh, it's not really a lecture, it's a dialogue. I hope that you will interrupt me. I have put up a few slides to generate the uh, seeds for potential discussion. But I do expect everybody to interrupt me as much as you want. If we get past two slides, that's all right. Uh, and I know from the fact that I did uh, something like this to a much smaller group during the summer that uh, you are quite capable of asking questions. You as a, as a uh, I guess as a, uh, as, a, as a group of interested individuals who are involved in teaching. So, so what I'd uh, like to do, in fact, it's interesting because I thought this was the last of a series of lectures. And it turns out it's the first. So I was just going to wrap the whole thing up. Oh. <laughs> and just give you a summary statement. And now I do not know what I'm going to do. So, so um, the, the, the topic this, this semester apparently is going to be microbes. And uh, I, I, in fact, it's, I heard something about disease. But in fact, the argument I'm going to be making today, and you'll hear it also in The Undiscovered Planet, is that bugs have gotten a bad rap. Bad rap you know, they, they really are mostly beneficial. And occasionally, a nasty guy gets out of hand, and, and you get into problems. But uh, so that's, that's something that, <laughs> that I hope you take from tonight's lecture. So maybe everybody else the rest of the semester will tell you how evil these things are. But in fact, I'll be telling you how wonderful they are. Uh, so <clears throat> what I've uh, put up here, uh, and I should say that the topic that I'm going to cover is very little to do with my research, although if, if you don't ask any questions, I will punish you. Uh, with some dreadfully complicated slides at the end about what we're actually doing in the laboratory. So ask questions and you'll be spared that. Uh, the topic that I want to cover about uh, today is dealt in part by this, uh, by this cover here, the gut inner tube of life, the fact that we have a remarkable microbial community that lives inside our gut. I'm going to talk about microbial communities that live on, on the human. And on, I mean topological surfaces that are on the outside that includes the entire gastrointestinal tract that is inside but really is outside. In fact, it's not clear that we have too many bugs living really inside, topologically inside. And in fact, having bugs in the bloodstream is indeed a very bad thing. And so uh, the body seems to be well protected by its natural barriers to keep bugs on the outside, but keep them in such a way that they can be incredibly useful in a symbiotic interaction. So I think one of the things that you will see now in the field is that the microbiota that is accompanying the human is beginning to be seen as a, as a, as a collection of beneficial symbionts as compared to the old words that we used to use, like uh, commensals, meaning that they come to eat, but they don't do anything with us or about us. Now, that's the, that's the reason for this image here. And the second image is uh, the tree of life, a phylogenetic tree that uh, relates all of life by sequence comparisons. I should say that this, <laughs> I like to call it the modern day trinity of science, the three domains of life, uh, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Uh, I hope that that is totally and absolutely familiar to everybody. Uh, not only that, but I hope that it is so familiar that you are instilling it from kindergarten 
onwards because this is something that certainly I must say as I meet the freshmen and entering graduate students at Harvard, they still are not deeply steeped in this paradigm. So that's one thing that I want to tell you about and I want to send you out with a message, we need to do it. But we may, I may be speaking to the choir, uh, uh, preaching to the choir because maybe you are the group that is selected uh, for being those teachers that already teach this. And the people who aren't yet teaching it are not coming to these events. <laughs> so that's, uh, so somehow you've got to get the word out there that they should be changing the paradigm. So I'll start, any questions thus far? We're okay on the, on the title slide. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so I, I even got the date right, isn't it? Okay, so, so who then are our bugs? That's the, that's the topic that I want to address. Who is it that lives on us so intimately and so importantly to our well-being? And uh, I'll start with the end. As I said, I was, uh, I'm going to wrap it up with a big summary. And, and I'll start with the end with something that we all recognize. And, uh, and what I want to do afterwards is, is uh, uh, deal from a historical perspective, how did we come to get there? I think one of the things that happens in science education is that people who get most excited about sciences tend to be the ones that are allergic about history, which I think is a travesty, because how can it be that you can appreciate science without treating it from a historical perspective. That's the point I want to make. So we know now that we have a remarkable community of microbes living uh, on us, and, and I'll just bring up two examples of how widespread that knowledge is. So the first example is an article that comes from the New York Times of about uh, a, uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, it was by uh, Nicholas Wade. Uh, you probably all are familiar with his uh, writings. Epic of human migration is carved in parasites' DNA. So, so what do you think? How many of you are familiar with this article? <laughs> That's all right. OK, you are. So you are not the target of this question. Though, so you, just from the title, what do you think might Nicholas Wade be telling us about in the rest of the article? Well, probably that the parasites evolved with like were pre-humans, and as the human populations migrated out, they took small subpopulations of the parasites in the section eight drift. Yeah, so what, what the, the gentleman in the third row is saying is that perhaps some of these parasites that have been associated with humans have been so tightly associated with humans that we can actually watch what humans have done in terms of migration by looking at the DNA associated with the parasites that those humans have. Right, that's pretty neat. Or you can put it the other way around. Knowing how humans might have migrated, we can see which parasites have come along with the humans and which ones haven't, depending on how they have changed. Now, carved in parasites' DNA. What might carved in parasites' DNA be a metaphor for? This is very simple, yes. Those mutations that happen and then they happen in one place and then they'll, they'll cluster there. That's right, so mutations. It's the carving is the changing of the base sequence in the DNA. And what this little picture is showing us is that uh, you can draw relationships, familial relationships, mother, great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandmother, and along with those, they are tied little bugs shown here. And that's what's remarkable. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. About, does anybody know of an example of this that is really remarkable, that, that uh, tells us uh, so, some of the results have been found already about this type of stuff? Perhaps any guesses that people would like to know? This is the stuff that is sort of common knowledge to the lay public, right? Yes? Uh, not microbial, but uh, Spencer Wells and the Y chromosome and those uh, mutations. Yeah, no, of course, those the mutations in the human genome have been quite important, you know, and we've used the, uh, you know, the, the, the phylogeny both of uh, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA. You know, the mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, so that's been used to follow evolution. It's been seen that there was a big bottleneck as they crossed from Africa into Europe. Yes, but I'm thinking microbial. Which microbes have been with us, uh, and what do they tell us about those microbes' ecology? Has anybody got, there's a couple of examples that are really wonderful. And since nobody's yelling out, I want to say, I want to say. 
Have you guys heard about Helicobacter pylori? Yes, of course, you know, Nobel Prize because it causes ulcers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's neat. You know that three generations ago, there were migrations of Japanese people that went to Peru. The Peruvians of Japanese ascendants, three generations, the children are still harboring the Japanese strain of Helicobacter pylori. Now, what does that tell you about Helicobacter pylori? A time transmission is probably infection during birth. That's right. So it tells you that there's not much getting it from the environment, but probably we're getting it from our parents. Right? Probably uh, uh, as soon as you're born, you start suckling on the mother's breast, and the mother's breast is inoculated with a strain. Even though it's living in the stomach, some of it gets out, and that's the argument that is made. There's another wonderful example, that, which is uh, valley fever. Valley fever is uh, uh, it's, uh, caused by a particular type of fungus, which uh, people have had for a long time, uh, 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 a, a difficult time identifying where is it that we get it from. Because people don't find environmental reservoirs of this fungus that causes valley fever, very widespread in the southwest of the US. It turns out that we've, uh, the people have now shown that as the Amerindians uh, um, migrated from uh, the North Americas to the South America, they took the virus, with, the, the fungus with them. In fact, the fungus does not have an environmental reservoir. Apparently, we are the reservoir and we carry it. And it has mutated along with us as we have mutated in our migrations. So it's pretty neat. It actually opens up a whole field of sort of microbial anthropology. And so anthropologists need to be well versed in microbiology and vice versa. Okay. Then there is an article that is from the Boston Globe, a little closer to at least to this home. Uh, uh, although online now you can get all of these equally the same. But this is from February of this year. Your body, a colony of creatures. That's actually the name of this little graph. And this is what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today, and we'll, we'll just uh, summarize what we now know and where are the efforts that are going on, some of the things that are actually quite revealing and quite interesting that are very, very recent developments. You might think that historically we should have known this for a long, long time, but in fact, it's only the last couple of years that we have really come to realize the remarkable diversity of organisms that are harbored by the human. So let's just, let me tell you a few things. I know that they cannot be read from back there, but I just decided to take the graphic straight out of the, to start out of the article. And it's accompanied by, by a very nice article, in this case by, ah, I'm forgetting Nickerson, but what's his first name? Anyways, the science writer from the Globe. So <clears throat> the first thing is that for all that we can tell right now, we are born sterile. In fact, uh, sterile meaning no micro population uh, colonizing the human. In fact, that is a little bit in question now, but for all intents and purposes, we still think that the placental uh, uh, fluid is sterile unless there's been a compromise and that uh, the child is born bacteria free. And then it is inoculated uh, immediately at birth through the passage of the birth canal and the first breath of life and the first ingestion of air and the first ingestion of food colonizes it. So there's going to be a fair amount of maternal uh, inheritance of passing of the microbiota from uh, mother to child. And so what this indicates is that there's been a number of studies, and I'll tell you about those studies uh, in a second, that have identified the number of species that have been present in a single individual in such places as, as the teeth, or the esophagus, or the stomach, or the colon, the vagina, or the skin. So these are the areas that have been studied thus far. Uh, not so much the lungs. These are still thought to be rather sterile in healthy individuals, uh, as compared to, for example, tuberculosis. And, and this idea that the mouth uh, has dozens, if not more, of coexisting species, and in fact, all of these numbers are rather conservative because it says any given individual. In fact, some of the estimates for teeth range into the, into the many hundreds of different species. And we can talk about what species means in the microbial world uh, in a, if, if you, if you uh, so desire. The colon, of course, quite fascinating because the colon is extremely diverse in the number of species that are residing there and um, also the amounts of cells 
that are present in the colon are remarkable. So we like to give two numbers to just wow the individuals listening. Uh, one of them is that the total number of cells in the colon exceeds the number of total number of human cells in the entire body by at least tenfold, if not a hundredfold. So next time you consider yourselves as a human body, consider yourselves as a, as a few human cells harboring a lot of microbial cells, or think of it as a very clever microbial cells that have managed a way to domesticate this beast to carry them around, harbor them, give them food, and keep them happy. Uh, the other thing that we like to uh, say is that because of the species diversity, the richness of the biodiversity in that ecosystem, the number of genes, of unique genes present in the human, as you know from the Human Genome Project now estimated at 18 to 20,000, and there's a little dot that represents that number in terms of area, and the number of microbial genes that are present in our uh, microbial com uh, communities, probably some three million genes. So in terms of thinking about genetic diversity, uh, <laughs> there are some 18,000 human genes and three million bacterial or otherwise microbial genes. Okay, any questions? Any questions that arise now? Yes? 195 species in the cold sounds too low. Yes, that's why I said these are extremely conservative and we'll see that in fact there are more and, uh, and, and I'll get to that in a little bit. It's, uh, it's low except <laughs> in comparison to what we used to think 10 years ago. We, we might have thought that it was 10. So that's, that's it. But in fact, hundreds is, uh, is, the, is the usual number that we use because this 195 can go up to 600. So, and, and we, it's interesting because we do not know the ecological consequences. I'll, I'll say right away that it's uh, another beautiful thing about this is that it's a rather stable community. So that if you probe it a long time, it doesn't vary very much from individual to the same individual later in time. But if you probe the individual next door to that person, it's gonna be quite different. So in fact, the number that we like to say is that if I probe 20 people in this audience, by the time I get to the 20th and I compare the 20 top most abundant species, the overlap in that set between individuals has reached zero. Right, so each person carries their characteristic individual mixture of species, very similar in composition at certain phylogenetic levels, but very unique or extremely unique at the species level. Okay. And the question that is addressed here, how does that translate to family? And uh, in fact, interestingly, uh, twins can have more closely related uh, uh, communities. After that, it gets a little bit uh, more difficult uh, and of course, the parents, uh, since they were raised separately, and that, that they come in with very different uh, communities. So in fact, the, the determinants of the community have not been established. So what, how much is genetic and how much is environmental? Yes? Compared to the similarity of communities in identical twins versus fraternal twins? I don't think that has been done yet. In fact, the, the, the little bit that there's on twins is only uh, extremely uh, uh, sporadic. And I'll tell you what that is. In fact. We have only, in the, uh, in the last three years, begun to establish the methodology that allows us to say this. So you're right, it's a low number compared to what the results actually have been published that, that, uh, that are published in this, in this article in the Globe, but, uh, but it's only recently that we know that it's in the hundreds. Surprisingly, yes? Uh, when you compare the species between identical twins, is it also true that they're similar if you've got cesarean deliveries? No, uh, th th as I said, that is not enough studies have been done, but what is clear is that people born with a cesarean have dramatically different microbiota than people who are born through the birth canal. That's very clear. What's not so clear yet, and people are beginning to investigate, is how different is the residual micro, the, 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 the stabilized microbiota of children that have uh, before and after treatment with antibiotics. So that's a, that's a big unknown and has tremendous poten potentially tremendous consequences to what we, how we deal with the future in terms of antibiotic therapies. I have a question about Kyrie's bacteria transfer from plants to 
Spain. About what? Parents to babies. Yeah, the caries bacteria that cause tooth decay. Oh, caries, streptococcus, streptococcus mutants. Yeah, I, I do not know if there's any evidence that there is a preference for that going uh, mother to child. Uh, strep mutants is normally present in the teeth, but in very small amounts, but it can shift, and it shifts dramatically in amounts with respect to diet. And that's why sugar is, the, is a bad thing to eat, because it, these guys can uh, live on sucrose and, uh, and generate the acid that gives rise to uh, caries of the teeth. But I don't know if it's known that there's greater or lesser prevalence uh, uh, in colonization patterns. Not enough has been done about how the mouth gets colonized. In fact, nothing has been done about how any of these places get colonized to know, to know the answer to this. So we need to get there, but that's sort of... So it's, it's fascinating in many ways, right, that this is a technique that maybe we should have known. This is a, a, a fact that we should have known 60 years ago, but we didn't. In fact, this type of diversity we had no idea about. Yes, you have a question. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, you probably don't know this yet, but you will soon, I guess, over time in one individual, I mean, does it just, do you think it keeps increasing, the, the diversity in one individual? Ah, so the question is, uh, what do we know about the, uh, uh, the timing of the establishment of this microbiota? And it's interesting because uh, in the early, uh, people have done this not in a single individual, but by just grouping uh, people. They've asked what, what is happening. And, and the, the sense that we have, and it's got to be confirmed by longitudinal studies, is that early on, you have a flora that is constantly changing. So if you look at early times, and you look at the broad characteristics of the, of the microbiota, uh, and you look at one, uh, a few days, uh, one month, three months, six months, it, there it's dynamic. You're getting lots of changes in the general population. By the time you get to be two to four years, it seems to have established something that looks remarkably like the adult microbiota. And that remains long, for a long time. That was already an indication of that when we had only very primitive ways of assessing diversity. Is there like a limit, do you think? That yes. Human organism can carry? Oh, you mean in terms of the diversity? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that there's a limit in the, in, the, in the high hundreds, but I cannot tell you why that limit is. Yeah. Uh, uh, probably because there's a great selection for the type of food that they are given. Uh, it's a very restricted diet, really, when you consider it compared to what is out in the planet uh, for utilization as growth medium. But there was something else. Oh, yeah, the, the, the stability does decay uh, in geriatric patients. So. Uh, so that's very clear also, that as, as people get really quite old, then their microbiota begins to shift tremendously. Is there a shift, you mentioned before, like when two parents get married and they live together and their environment is the same? That's wonderful. Uh, uh, is there a horizontal gene transfer among their bacteria besides the horizontal gene transfer that leads to progeny? <laughs> 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 it's great. It's a great question. You know, I am sure there is, has not been looked at. It just, just would be great to look at when people begin to have sex and begin to kiss. Uh, I mean, that's a major exchange. And is, are there boundaries? Is your immune system in some way controlling that uh, microbiota in adulthood? Or is there going to be some exchanges? Lots of wonderful things. A lot has been done with vaginal uh, uh, communities in terms of before and after intercourse. And there's great shifts. And there's also great shifts with menopause. That's been done a lot, but not so much with two parents getting together and do they begin to uh, resemble each other with time. <laughs> It'd be great to find out. Depends on how happy they are. <laughs> in fact, I will argue the opposite. I'll argue that just how close those microbiota get is a great predictor of the happiness of the marriage. <laughs> After all, it's our bugs who make us feel the way we feel, right? Uh, is there any, have there been studies on how your flora affects your epigenome? Epigenome. Can you tell me what you mean by epigenome? And I'll tell you. Just whether sections are turned on or turned off based on your diet, your environment? Yes, uh, uh, wonderful new work. Uh, I'll just have a title. A lot is now being done in terms of how critical this microbiota is for the, for the development of the immune system. It's remarkable. So the, the, the healthy development of the immune system absolutely requires the presence of these, of these bugs in the intestine. So it's clearly a, a very... Uh, uh, well uh, uh, um, uh, regulated symbiosis. Yeah, you partially answered the question, but 
I we look at E. coli as an essential organism for vitamin K and things of that sort. But are there others that are as essential? In fact, you know, it's interesting because uh, what you are referring to is, of course, almost archaic in the sense that that was the case when uh, we thought E. coli was one of the major uh, population uh, 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 um, constituents of the, of the flora. Now we know that it's one of the minor ones. In fact, it's in there as a very small minority, just as easy to cultivate, and so that's why it always came out in, in culture, and, and I'll come to that in, in a second. So now, uh, we need to know more about the genomes of those that we haven't been normally cultivating to see if they can also make vitamin K because while it can make vitamin K, it's not clear that it actually is doing that, playing that role uh, in us, in our normal flora. So uh, I'll, I'll show some data that is beginning to address that some groups of bacteria are responsible for some... <laughs> yes? You've been talking about these microbes in relation... I thought you were going to say you've been talking too long, shut up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't it. Okay, I've been talking about microbes in relationships to humans. What about yes. the microbes in relationships to each other? Oh, they are remarkable interactions between. We do not know too much about how they're interacting with each other here, uh, but that's a that's a wonderful area. And uh, we had good, you know, they, this is ha exactly what happened last summer. I was talking about some other topic, and they told me I should talk about the human gut. You know, there's a remarkable story in, in a long-term uh, uh, symbiosis, some 60 million years this symbiosis has been going on. That's a lot longer than we have been around. Between ants and fungi that they grow to make food. And it turns out those fungi have a pathogenic fungus that attacks them. And the ants, through evolutionary times, have coated themselves with actinobacteria that produce antifungal agents that are specifically targeted against the pathogen fungus, but not the cultivar. All right, and it turns out that uh, this is remarkably uh, 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 example of coevolution because you look at one strand, one one uh, group of ants, they have their own pathogenic fungus, their own cultivar fungus, and their own actinobacteria. And you look at another ant and it has its own group of fungi, its own pathogen for that fungus. The fungus pathogen has co-evolved. Pretty neat. There's another one called the... How long do you want me to answer that question for? There are many examples of interactions, chemical interactions between microorganisms. Not so much known in the interactions between the thousands of species that are making their, the body, their habitat, and how they're interacting with each other. There's some sense that some of them exclude some others by uh, some sort of antagonistic interaction, and there may be some cooperation, some mutualistic interaction. Very good. Keep at it. Based on that, if you had said before that if a child is breastfed, it's going to get the mother's bacteria on her skin. And if the child is bottle fed, will it be eventually getting the same bacteria? Not the same, no, uh, quite different. In fact, the dynamics of colonization is very different. And uh, eventually, of course, they change to a diet and they might have, but in fact, that could be a big factor on who eventually settles that person. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I have a question about the sense of evolution and human evolution. If you looked, these numbers, I think, are coming from populations in the Western, non-isolated cultures of humans. These, these numbers are coming from, uh, yes, mostly, uh, in which cases have it, has it gone beyond the Western world? Most of them are coming from Western, yeah, yeah. Because I'm wondering if you look at human, this, this, look for the same information in human cultures that are fairly isolated, yeah. what would that tell you about, um, I guess I'm wondering if you would predict there's a threshold limit to where you need to have X number or X variety in order to persist in population that's very heterogeneous versus being in your own little isolated population. And yeah. I'm not talking about communities that live far from other human communities. Yeah, you know, I, my, my sense is that you're going to find uh, uh, probably uh, along races, there will be a lot of differences, uh, but not as dramatic as that community that you can say is associated with human to the community that is in the soil where the humans, uh, that, that, so that we as humans are serving as a remarkable selective <coughs> niche for breeding certain types of bacteria that are very different than the ones in the soil. 
and that those are more dramatic changes than the ones that you will find between uh, different human races. But there probably will be races, and a lot of them could be associated with uh, genetics, and a lot of them could be associated with lifestyles, without a doubt. Okay, wow. Where's Tara when I need her? <laughs> She's out. So is that, is that time out, or do I keep? I go for, for a couple of things. We, we did the two slides that I promised you. That was the end. So now, uh, who are our bugs? And here I want to take a historical perspective. I told you that I wanted to go to history. And the first person that, uh, at least in writing, recognized that we were full of bugs was this gentleman. I cannot call these guys young men anymore. Uh, this gentleman. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, and here's one of his famous uh, crude microscopes. You guys all teach this to your students. 1600s, uh, a, a, a remarkable observation. He did exactly what you might imagine that any curious person would that begins to see worlds unseen. He scraped parts of his body, mostly his teeth, and he came up with this wonderful statement in 1683. All the people living in our United Netherlands are not as many as the living animals that I carry in my mouth this very day. So he already recognized the remarkable number, and he actually drew some figures that are not, not terribly far from the truth. After all, these bacteria all tend to look very similar. Some spirochetes, of course, we know that they are predominant. Some cocci, this is the one that you were asking about, the streptococci, they're not always causing <laughs> uh, caries, but there they are. Some of them can swim. He says they're here and they move to there, and some of them are long rods, etc. And that's pretty much how this stood for a couple of centuries. The idea of what these bugs were doing to the human, they were there, and it was an anecdotal description. They're there, it's amazing. I've got more bugs than there are people in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> there are more bugs probably than there are, <laughs> you know, the number is way exceeds the number of humans in, uh, in the planet. So it doesn't have to say that, that he, he just wanted to make the case. So, <laughs> but then, can I, can I, yes. You said the spirochetes are the dominant bacteria. No, they are predominant. They are not the dominant, but they are quite dominant. They are, it's they are, also they also are quite. That, so, so they are quite numerous. They are among the among the, uh, the majority, but no, they are not the, the predominant. We'll, we'll see. In fact, I can tell you that the, the dominant bacteria in this they tend to be the gram positives that are called firmicutes. Uh, and then the proteobacteria, but, uh, but the spirochetes are quite uh, numerous yeah. in the mouth. So okay, then, then uh, the first person who really began to address the issue of what bugs are doing in the planet uh, was this young man, Louis Pasteur, you all know him because of, he really began and the, 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 the field of microbiology. Well, while Liebenhoek could see them, this uh, individual really began to study them and recognized that the vast transformations in the planet were mediated by biochemical reactions that were mostly the result of microbial activities. And, uh, and in fact, his, his main contribution, I would say, is that he did not see that difference between the microbial activities that he saw working in the environment and the microbial activities that he saw on the human. So in terms of what are the agents of disease, well, he's oftentimes equated with that because he was working with rabies and such things. His, his contribution is much more broad about the universality of processes. And I have here the remarkable finding that fermentation was, in fact, a microbial product. And, uh, and uh, th those bread and wine staples in our diet um, were key microbial products. In fact, I, I love, so you know all of this, but maybe you do not know this next slide that relates to Pasteur. This is something that if you travel in France, you'll see this on occasion. These are posters that are saying a few things that I love to spend the rest of the class in. This is, uh, it says here, for example, the average of life of a human, 59 years for those that drink water. 65 years for those that drink wine. You can teach that to your high school students. It, it, it would be healthy, let me tell you. They would take a more healthier approach to drinking. So 87% of those who are centenaries, you know, uh, over 100, 
87% are wine drinkers. The wine, it says here, is it the milk of the old people? And then the most important phrase, wine is the, most, the healthiest and the most hygienic of all beverages. So, Pasteur, who was pretty smart, recommends the wine. Uh, so do I. In fact, I believe that among all of the microbial activities of the planet, appreciating a good glass of wine is key. And if you could just teach kids to drink wine as part of their diet, they might not guzzle down the vodka when they're, <laughs> as soon as they're able to buy it Ill illegally. Anyway, so I'm a, I'm a fanatic of wine. This is the guy, a few years after Pasteur, who historically first identifies microbes as the cause of disease. So Koch uh, notices that many of these bacteria that people are beginning to isolate, that Pasteur is beginning to show that you can cultivate in pure, uh, in pure culture, isolate, and you can characterize as the, the ones who are carrying fermentation. He's the one who first says, you know, I think these are the guys who are causing disease. And he notices in a particular problem that is occurring in uh, Germany in the uh, uh, turn of the century, of the, of the 19th century, and it's this. And what is this? Anthrax. And what does anthrax mean? You know, we say it very fast, but we, don't know, we never pay attention to the etymology. It means coal. The Bacillus anthracis is, is the name of the causative agent. It means coal. Why does it mean coal? Because look at this. body is black. It just looks like coal. So anthrax just means... Anthracite. You got it. There you are science teachers. You should know etymology of these words. Very good. So anthrax means coal, and these animals are turning black. And he beautifully shows that this is the cause, uh, this is caused by a single microbial species, Bacillus anthracis. Microbes cause disease. And to date, when you will be hearing all about microbes and disease by the rest of the lectures, the rest of this term, not by me, you will hear that the, there is something that is a pathogen that causes something. And the reason they assert that is because they are following Cox postulates. Written already in 1890, that first, in order to conclusively show that a org an organism causes a disease, you must find the microbe in the diseased animal, then you must take it out and purify it and into its gr until it's growing in pure culture, that is, there is no other species around. Then you take that and infect a healthy animal, and once again you cause a disease, the exact same disease, and then you re-isolate the organism, and then you have satisfied Koch postulates. You know, in fact, for a long time, and it uh, was uh, debated because the HIV virus uh, uh, was not clear that it was the causative agent, and it was unethical to do the experiment. So, in fact, the idea that it, you could reinfect and cause the disease, so, so for a long time there was huge arguments. Was it, really, is it HIV? So this is still extremely powerful, but it also dramatically affected the way the world as a whole perceived, and scientists in particular followed their research, thinking about microbes as agents of disease. One of the most dramatic examples of that is what this man in, had as an influence, Ilyich Mechnikovich. Now, he is very famous because he poked uh, a thorn on a starfish. You guys know that? No. no. He poked a starfish with a, with a thorn and he watched these little cells that came along and started engulfing foreign objects. He called those phagocytes. He's the father of modern immunology and he won the Nobel Prize in 1908 for those discoveries. And when he found that out, that he was a protege of Pasteur, and when he found out the uh, Koch's postulates, and he recognized that our intestines are absolutely chock full of bacteria, he espoused the idea that what you had to do is just absolutely cut it out, because all it was causing was putrefaction 
in the body, and that the only way to live longer was not to drink wine, but to cut your intestines off. And a surgeon believed them uh, by the name of Lane and performed thousands of these things uh, with horrible consequences. So for a while in the early 1900s, it was commonly done that people would go in to get their intestines taken out. Mostly done in cases of severe uh, constipation, but it was done. So, the 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 lower intestine, various lengths <laughs> from total to, you know, but that's where most because the, the, this intestine, the, the small intestine, is not so full of bacteria. This is what where they felt that putrefaction was. But he was an interesting character. He was a sort of a study in contrast because he also thought that lactic acid was a key preser preserver of health. And uh, he, therefore, he drank every day of his life uh, yogurt, fermented milk. He took uh, uh, fermented milk to keep, he had no idea why he was doing it, it was lactic acid, he was just taking uh, this. And so one of his students was inspired by that uh, guy by the name of Minuro Chirota. And Minuro Chirota, as you might imagine, trained with Mechnikov, but then went back to Japan and spent his entire life, or good f fortune of his life, purifying bacteria that were coming in this fermented milk and generating a beverage that he would recommend to everybody. And by the late 1930s, he had marketed something called Yokult, which is <laughs> Lactobacillus casei, which is the same bug that Europeans have been using for making yogurt. In fact, the idea is yogurt is supposed to be the way Japanese pronounce yogurt. Did Mechnikov ever put this drink under the microscope? He didn't. He, that, well, that's what he, uh, Shirota began to do. And so but then, of course, that drink is a normal fermentation that is not pure culture, just a, a, a number of them. There's actually not that many, but yogurt contains several if you just make it at home. But to date, you buy the very same drink in Japan as a probiotic, which is why yogurt has been uh, recommended by so many to, as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, a, 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 a nutrition while you're antibiotic therapy to prevent fungal infections, etc. Just a, it's the concept of probiosis. So it's pretty neat, the history of things. But even in 1982, when uh, Shirota died and the world was already drinking yogurt. We still had no concept of who really was there. There was this massive putrefaction in the gut that was supposed to be causing most of the disease. And there was the possibility of isolating some bacteria, such as Lactococcus casei, that would maybe make you feel better, right? So there was a sense that some of them were nasty and some of them were good. OK, but no sense that we had hundreds of species around. OK. So now, when did we come to find out that there were many? Here again, I'm going to deal with this historically. And I want to make a point that rather than thinking of a health and then a, 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 a microbe comes along and causes disease, which is very much the Kohian view, I'm going to espouse an ecological view that says that what you're really seeing is uh, shades of gray, that you're looking at shifts in the ecology where the microbial populations are shifting, and that is leading to the symbiosis shifting from a mutualism to a parasitism. Right, so from the healthy individual to this one that is presumed, to, I mean, it's a picture of somebody perhaps suffering from tuberculosis has become infected. But really, I'm arguing that it is more an ecological balance. And so when we talk about that, is let's think about how do we evolve that thought of ecology. And so for that, I bring you back to the founding father of ecology. This is somebody, this is probably somebody you guys have not recognized or thought about. Koch and Pasteur and Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, they are, they are really well known. Heckel is, of course, well known among ecologists, but uh, he was a naturalist. He was one of those wonderful people who had a talent for painting. And, uh, you know, this is, this is just lost today among us scientists. You know, we uh, just don't 
take the time anymore to look at nature. Uh, and he was fascinated by uh, the, the patterns and similarities of patterns and how they are existing in different places and how they might be related. So in fact, he was the first one to begin to look at species interactions, that's the ecology, but also to look at interactions between organisms and try to relate those organisms in some way or another. And the concept of phylogeny. Uh, he made a fascinating uh, leap of faith. He actually came up with the idea, he was also interested in evolution, and he came up with the idea that if you followed the, embryon, uh, uh, the em embryonic development, that you could actually look at the entire phylogeny of that individual being, that is its evolutionary history, by looking at the history of the embryo. And that became something known as ontogeny, recapitulation phylogeny, and everybody eventually laughed at it. The whole idea was that the human embryo would, went through little things that looked like tadpoles, and little fish and had gills and of course you have heard about this uh, and it's sort of I think that's why he is pictured here like like that he says what have I done you know I, I was doing so well and all of a sudden I made this mess but he made something really important despite this uh, breach he came up with this idea of biodiversity on the planet and he's the first one to draw trees that related organisms in the planet and he called these organisms plants and animals and protists. And then he labeled these things monera. And monera were little things that you could observe but you couldn't tell too much about. And what's fascinating about Heckel is that this is true, Heckel in the, uh, in the turn of the century. And if you look at uh, the similar three relationships that existed up until 1976, they hadn't changed one bit. In fact, you might teach your students that the world is composed of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And the only change in this tree that occurred between the time that Heckel proposed it and the time that Stanier and uh, Van Niel proposed the prokaryote-eukaryote concept is that now instead of calling them planta, fungi, animalia and protista, and Monera, you would call them planta, fungi, animalia, protista, and prokaryotes. And all of these others were eukaryotes. But the way that we thought that organisms were related in the planet didn't change until 1977. And it changed dramatically. And I want you to teach your students how enormous a change in worldview occurred in 1977. So, this view disappeared. The problem is it hasn't really disappeared, but it disappeared in terms that we gain a better view of the world, a more accurate view of the world. But for some reason we insist on teaching this view. And I do not know why, but I implore you, stop. <laughs> and if you have already stopped, tell them why they should stop, right? And the reason they should stop is that this young man, Carl Woese, working in remarkable isolation, began to compare sequences of conserved genes, primarily the small subunit of the RNA, uh, small subunit of the ribosome, an RNA component of that. And through that, he came up with this completely new view in which there were three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And more dramatic than that, and quite germane to the idea that we're talking about, is that Norm Pace took this idea and said, let's go out into the world and no longer cultivate the organisms, but simply fish for what DNA is out there and ask where does it land in that tree. And he did that by going to Yellowstone, to some ponds in Yellowstone, and there he just took some sediments from boiling water and in that, an isolated DNA, sequenced the DNA for the conserved genes, and in that little pond, he found more diversity than people had found anywhere, everywhere in the planet beforehand. And the diversity was all in the bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryal domains that are mostly all microbes. 
all of those plants, animal, and fungi that were the majority of the diversity of the planet were constrained to some little corner of the diversity tree. Now, that's a completely different view of the planet. Now, what that's done in 1994. So, environmental microbiologists have known about this since 1994, about where the diversity lies, and it took so, so, sorry, this is just in terms of how much more diversity there was in the bacterial branch in 94, 13 different deep branching divisions. By 2004, there were 80 divisions, most of which we have not ever cultivated. So the diversity lies in the microbial world. It is not easy to cultivate. So that just tells us of how ignorant we are about the microbial world. including our bodies. So now we can say, when did people begin to apply this idea to the body, to the human body? Because we were addressing, how come is it that it's only in 2007 that we're beginning to talk about these things in the, in the general? And so back to this, back to this idea that I showed you at the beginning. And it isn't until 99, five years later, that somebody dares do this approach of culture-independent assessment of communities in the human gut. He does a small work, his name is Joel Doré, and in fact, he receives very little credit for having done this. He did it in 99, and he looked at 300 different sequences and obtained that there were 80 species in the human. But you see, one of the problems is that the number that he's addressing of of sequences is small, and you do not know when this curve is going to reach an asymptote, right? And then why was it that people interested in gut microbiota took six more years until they published this in Science in 2005, Diversity of Human Intestinal Microflora? So now this is done with three individuals, and this is going to address some of the questions that you were asking before. Somebody said that the number 195 was low. So here you can see that there's three individuals, and now the reason this appears in science and not in the AEM journal that the other one was is that they've done massive sequencing. So now instead of 300, their numbers are like 3,000 samples, 3,500 samples. Three individuals, three subjects. Basically, it says the exact same thing as the other paper did. There's plenty of different species, but now they're beginning to flatten out. In this case, around 200 species. In this case, about 300, maybe still going up. In this case, about 125. So there's your numbers. So that's why that reporter in the Globe decided to say 195. He could have said anywhere from a couple hundred to four or 500, maybe. There's been other studies since then. So that's basically, it's not until 2005 that we begin to assess the gut microbiota. And in fact, if you look at the types of very deep branching classes, which we call these things phyla or divisions. Then what I want you to show, uh, what you see here is in black are all the known divisions. I, I showed there's something like 80 such divisions uh, now known. And in red are the predominant ones in the human. So even though there's hundreds of species, when you look at big uh, uh, classifications, that is phyla, which, which uh, 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 firmicutes, proteobacteria, and these uh, cytophaga or bacteroides uh, are, are, the, uh, are the predominant ones. And in green, some of the lesser ones, spirochetes. Somebody said ah, so spirochetes are here, and the actinobacteria, fusobacteria. So you see that they are in green. They're sort of in the second era uh, uh, level of uh, dominance. And so I want to leave you with just a couple of interesting things. I see that uh, Steve Callerwood is waiting out there to give the next lecture, so I'm... Pardon me? Oh, what do I mean to, uh, that to, to the archaea? So this is a tree that just talks about the bacteria, and the tree has a connection to the archaeal group. This just means that if you drew the whole tree, there'd be a big branch here, that the archaea would be all there, and the archaea would be there. But we're not finding any archaea. And very archaea. few. Remarkably, very few. A few have been identified, but uh, in numbers very low and, uh, and uh, low diversity. Yeah, we don't seem to harbor archaea. Archaea tend to be found in lots of places, but not so much in the human. But people haven't looked so much for them. You see, because the, the technique that you use for looking at this, you have to begin with the bias that you're looking for bacteria. So I just want to, I think I only have a couple more uh, slides. 
So the first thing is, what are these bugs doing in our gut? We don't know. But a few people are beginning to make some questions. And obesity has been a big, big topic of interest, mostly done by Jeffrey Gordon and his co-workers in uh, Washington uh, University at St. Louis. And this is, a, this is a pretty little paper that indicates that people, if they change their diet, will change their microbiota. And so what does this one figure tell us? The first thing I just tell you that there are some people, they took people who were obese and they put them on fat restricted diet and carbohydrate restricted diets. And the first thing I want to tell you is to pay attention to this phylogenetic tree. That's uh, made by looking at the entire community of each individual that was in this study and asking at at the beginning of the study, at a certain amount of time, and at a later time, and this study lasted like a year or something like that. And so the first interesting thing is that even though time went by, the more closely related communities, and they're taking the entire community and calling that a particular uh, uh, line in the, in the dendrogram. So for example, patient red at time zero, time one, and time three, they are still the more cl uh, closely clustering, right? So that individual, even though their microbiota change, they still, you can recognize it as the closest to him or her, right? That's the first, the first uh, uh, message that this, this uh, figure shows. Not so tight here, but still you can see the black here and the orange here is, is clustering. But there are a couple cases in which there's no clustering. The other one, then let's look at B. Here's the percentage of firmicutes to bacteroiditis that people have on average. If they're lean, they have more percentage of bacteriolitis and slightly less uh, 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 of firmicutes than if they are obese. But if they're on the diet, you can see that the percentage of firmicutes is increasing. So the idea is that who you have is affected by what you eat. And interestingly here is if you look at the change in the bacteroiditis abundance as a function of the change in body weight in percent is showing two graphs. And the point is that if you're a carbohydrate restricted diet, the graph is shallower. That is, the change in body weight is less than if you're changing for the similar percentage of change in bacteroiditis uh, percentage, you get the much greater percent in body weight. So he's beginning to correlate body weight to bacterial microbiota. It's, in many ways, you can say that's pretty neat because you can begin to imagine that you can do the opposite and you can eat lots of firmicutes and you'll lose weight. Uh, people are beginning to say we should uh, bias our diet of bacteria to see who we can colonize. Uh, the other way you can say, well, this is sort of stupid. You know, uh, nothing, is that the level of knowledge that we have? That's the truth. We are pretty much in diapers when it comes to the ecology of our microbiota. We're still very much living in the idea that we just have to avoid cholera getting in there. I have to just say that because of Steve. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one that I love. This is from Dennis Kaspers, and this is the one that I was saying that there are molecules that are coming from the bacteria that direct the maturation of the host immune system. So that more and more we are recognizing how essential these microbes are for the development of the human. This is really symbiosis in which is beneficial action of these organisms for our uh, development. And in the teeth, I want to, I believe I want to end with the teeth. The teeth have a, a remarkable uh, a, 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 a microbiota in the sense that we know that it's diverse, but also we know that when we have our teeth cleaned, they recolonize in a very organized way. So that there are some that come in as early recolonizers, then those that are recolonized uh, are serving as the signal for the new, new ones to uh, come and recognize them, and those serve as bridges for the later ones. So it's a very highly ordered structure of order of these many hundreds, of many, uh, many dozens of species that are assembling there. And what's neat about this, that in terms of teeth disease, Somebody asked about mutants. That was you who asked about strep mutants. That's a clear case of, yes, strep mutants there, sugar in the diet, explosive population, you get caries. It's not so clear with gingivitis. Gingivitis is a neat disease because it doesn't follow Koch's paradigm. That is, there doesn't appear to be a single agent that is causing gingivitis. 
And so that's what I like uh, to, to, to indicate that in a number of cases there's already good evidence that the ecology that surrounds the population shifts are actually quite important for the outcome. And here is what people at the foresight have been doing, mostly uh, Sokransky and his group. He has come up with groups of bacteria, which he calls by different color codes, and he has something called the, the, the red group, which contains three organisms that are predominantly increasing in number when the gingivitis progresses. But then there's this other group that seems to be needed to precede the outbursts of the red in order to prepare the ground for the red to be able to grow. So that's shown a little bit here. These are in, so this brings back to the idea of shades of gray. In healthy teeth, you have predominance of the purple, the actinomycetes, and the yellow and green groups. And then there's a succession to the orange. And if you don't have succession to the orange, you never get the blooming of the reds. And once you get that, that predisposes the whole thing to get the coloration of the reds going up in number, you get gingivitis. And the return to health means the returning back to the healthy community. So it's not that there's a causative agent, but rather that there's shifts in the community that are leading from this uh, shades of gray. So I leave you with this idea that we are uh, a remarkable colony of creatures, the vast majority of which are there, I believe, for the maintenance of health. Uh, and occasionally, unbalances or imbalances lead to the progression of some diseases. Now, a lot of things are being thought about changes in the microbiota and what that might have in terms of a number of illnesses. Uh, also, some issues about the colonization of the lung and how that might affect various uh, states of health. So, active area of research, a lot of mysteries, a huge project from the National Institute of Health to, which is called the microbiome, the human microbiome, to try to define the whole genomes and the whole suite of genes that is there. So a lot of emphasis being placed now on the ecology of the human microbiota. And that's where I end.